Our speaker this evening is uh, Professor Andrew Wilson. Uh, he's an archaeologist and heritage scientist with wide ranging research interests in digital heritage, human bioarchaeology, conservation and forensic archaeology. And he's based uh, in Bradford at the School of Archaeological and Forensic Sciences. So that's all splendid stuff, but even better than that, this man used to live in Saltaire. <laughs> he lived in Saltaire for eight weeks, eight years, not eight weeks, eight years in Constant Street. And he still lives in the buffer zone of the World Heritage Site. So not only is he a, is he a professor of archeology, span he's one of ours, which is wonderful. Um, he's going to speak tonight without, well, we, we'll, we'll give him a, a bit of, uh, a, a, you know, plenty of scope, but he's, he's put it up as a virtual future for heritage, which is interesting. Uh, I, I advertised it as history brought to life by 21st century cutting edge technology, which is a bit, bit more of a mouthful. But either way, I think we're going to enjoy all of this. Over to you, Andrew. Lovely. Thank you very much, Les and Jonathan, um, for inviting me. And uh, it, it's a real pleasure to, to talk um, to others who are, like myself, hugely passionate about salt air. Um, and as Les was saying, I, I spent um, eight years, I bought my first house in Constant Street, and um, I've loved living close to salt air ever since. Um, the image in front of you is not um, Saltaire, it's the city of Bradford. You can orientate yourself by seeing, um, I hope, the City Hall, uh, the Mirror Pool, and it's actually leading you as, uh, as the eye would uh, gaze up to the university where, where I do work. The reason I'm showing you this image is it's part of work that we're doing for a project called Virtual Bradford, and it's a partnership that has brought us closer together between the university and Bradford Council. And given that um, Salt Air World Heritage Site, of course, has its own conservation officer, Sheena Campbell, um, there is a, a, a real uh, series of, of reasons for, for explaining this, this, these links. And hopefully as we go through the presentation, you'll see that. I'm going to start by um, posing a question, really, uh, which is what heritage means to each of us. Part of my career, I've been focused on um, objects and buildings, and uh, really the, the, the meaning of heritage actually is quite a personal thing. And it, and it is those places that, that have, have some meaning to each of us. Um, and increasingly what we're seeing and, and the way in which we're using heritage in our work in, in Bradford is to, to link that tangible uh, heritage in, environment, uh, whether it's objects, buildings, monuments and landscapes, with the intangible. So very much a people-centred approach to, to, to heritage. And of course we've also got um, the parks and green spaces, woodlands and moorland that of course here for, for us in Saltaire surround, um, surround us, given that Bradford is, is, um, uh, is two thirds rural. Um, and, and we're very lucky obviously with that. And we've, we've all benefited from that during um, uh, the last two years with, with lockdown. A little bit about our school and the university. We've got a, a number of programs at undergraduate, at master's level and with research and two programs that we've launched relatively recently within the last uh, 18 months have been these two programs. One, a, a landscape uh, archaeology digital heritage master's program and an undergraduate program in heritage and archaeology. And what you'll see with both of those is that we are marrying these days that understanding that we bring from archaeology with this broader set of meanings for, for heritage. And for, for me in particular, it's how we make that relevant within contemporary society. And one of the things that has helped us with that are the capabilities that I've 
um, built up with colleagues um, around visualizing heritage. And you can see uh, a couple of my PhD students, uh, a colleague of mine, um, a senior scientist, Tom Sparrow, and uh, a couple of other colleagues, um, Chris Gaffney and Karina Croucher. Collectively, we've got a lot of things that we do, and you can see some of the bits of kit that we have there, both dealing with capture, uh, top left, Lee Su shown with a, a 3D laser scanner, um, and uh, the Brock of Musa uh, up in Shetland, and Joe Moore bottom left with a, th a 360 professional grade um, virtual reality camera. And of course, you're seeing Tom there top right um, in uh, a set of VR goggles looking at um, a site that we've reconstructed that of Palmyra in Syria. And a lot of what we're uh, concerned with is trying to, to showcase this. And some of you may well have seen some of the visualizations that have appeared in, in, in the news within uh, the last week or two relating to our work at Fountains Abbey. And this is an earlier piece of work, an earlier animation that takes you from aerial uh, drone imagery through the 3D laser scan data and shows you what's happening below ground. Here it's a series of graves. These are the monks' uh, graves in the vicinity of the abbey, but also more recently, we've got um, evidence of the, of the tannery and Chris Gaffney and Tom Sparrow have been instrumental with that work. And you see Tom here uh, relating um, what we can do um, to uh, enhance uh, the experience or the discoverability of, of heritage. And we've got a project in, uh, currently in Ireland that is looking to extend that reach, that discoverability um, uh, of landscapes uh, like the Burren and the heritage within it. I mentioned Syria and also we've done work in, in Kathmandu in Nepal. And um, that was stimulated by challenges that heritage uh, faces often, uh, whether it's conflict or natural disaster, we can, uh, with some of the capabilities we have in Bradford that we've developed, we can actually help. And one key project called Curious Travelers was involved in, in scraping imagery from the web, drawing it together with, with campaigns that involve the public, to actually recreate sites that have been damaged or lost. And here you can see Tom using a, a device called a, a mobile mapping device um, to help place some of that imagery for monuments such as this that had collapsed in the 2015 earthquake in, in Kathmandu. So from one World Heritage Site to another, um, and here again, um, uh, the World Heritage Site of Palmyra, destroyed by through conflict, but more importantly, following the reconstruction work that we've done, how we've actually connected with communities who've been displaced into camps in Jordan through a project called Breathe, building resilience through heritage, whereby we can take them um, back to those locations. And in some instances where we're looking at different generations, um, connecting um, children who've never actually known their um, home uh, origins. But I'm going to bring us back closer to home and the work that we're currently doing uh, in um, uh, Townscape Heritage. And you can see here one of our PhD students, uh, Joe Moore, um, doing some work that um, places buildings like church house, as you see here at the top of town, into that, that streetscape, into that uh, heritage context. And it was work that's really sort of catalyzed our, our interests um, in uh, responding to a call that the, the City Council put out. And that was to create a digital twin for the city. And you can see that it's essentially an area that bound, is bounded largely by the inner ring road with a few exceptions. So to orientate you, we've got the Mirapool, uh, and these are areas, of course, around the Alhambra, 
and Bradford Live that we felt were really important not to miss out as heritage locations within the city. And we're recording to a very high specification in terms of levels of detail, these LOD models that you can see represented uh, on the right. And it's a bespoke system. You can see Tom here uh, modeling the, the, um, uh, the bespoke capture system that we've developed that um, blends lots of different uh, types of data together. Aerial drone imagery to get roof lines and to get that understanding of terrain. The mobile mapping device at the top, this orange device that, that actually is, is a mobile laser scanner that enables us to get dimensional information with true accuracy. And that helps us to scale other data that we capture with um, conventional camera imagery uh, that we can position with uh, global positioning systems, drawing also upon um, uh, terrain data that we get from um, the Environment Agency, open access data uh, through those sources, and also um, 3D VR capture akin to what you see with Google Street View. Okay, and all of these different data systems come together. But the reason that we've got some of that imagery is not to invade people's privacy. This is imagery that's captured from the public realm, but it's to create 3D models. And you can see here imagery taken in little Germany where we've got um, these uh, individual um, camera positions shown that represent um, the 3D capture undertaken to create a 3D model of this sculpture. And in the bottom right hand image, you can see that we've got a representation here of, of that as point cloud data. So hugely immersive um, content that is um, sterile in terms of not having people or any um, personal information in there, but actually tremendously important if we're trying to recreate um, the cityscape. And we're starting with Bradford, but our aspiration is very much to see some of this work come through to places like Saltaire. Um, you can see Tom out here uh, in the thick of it, in the city centre, you've got Kirkgate. Um, this rather distorted image comes from, again, a, a 360 VR camera, but you've got the Kirkgate centre um, shown there uh, alongside some of the some of the other streets in the city and um, this is this is how this this data uh, comes to us in its raw form you can see again this is the top end of town with the Kirkgate Centre and um, the markets uh, and uh, the higher resolution imagery comes from from a static form of laser scanning but as I say, once we have that 3D model, and this will be the first open data 3D digital twin um, that we're aware of, most of these are produced commercially, and we're using European funding to generate this for the city. And Bradford is absolutely pushing above its weight to try and do uh, great things. And our aspiration is to try and link that. You can see here in the, the map data how uh, the model for the area that we're covering is only a stone's throw away, of course, from the, the World Heritage Site in Saltaire. So connecting one World Heritage Site, Bradford City of Film, with another Saltaire World Heritage Site is our aspiration. Using, of course, those historic linkways, um, the Bradford Canal, um, the spur that comes off the Leeds Liverpool Canal, bringing it through to, uh, to uh, the World Heritage Site. And of course, part of this is thinking how we can dovetail with some of the aspirations that the city have for active travel. And you can see some of that open source data from the Environment Agency, the recent data captured in March, blended with our own uh, more detailed data for an area 
adjacent to Canal Road that the council is um, going to be deculverting. Opening up these, these natural and wild spaces um, for uh, broader benefits. But you've come to the Saltair History Club tonight not to necessarily listen to all of those things relating to Bradford, but to see how some of the work we're doing absolutely connects through to the history and the heritage of Saltair. And you can see where we've done some pilot work already. This is mobile mapping data. You're looking in plan view along the canal that we've uh, come in uh, along from uh, the Bradford direction. And uh, you, you can see up Victoria Road there and you can see um, Salts Mill in plan view but you can also see uh, the United Reform Church. And one of the reasons why we've done some of this work here is that we've actually done quite a bit um, to um, uh, develop technologies and test technologies in conjunction with uh, partners such as uh, um, Tote United Reform Church. And you can see what Tom is, uh, is showing with um, some of the capture um, uh, here. This is real time. So walking pace, more or less, um, doing that mobile mapping. Um, and um, uh, essentially, um, we've captured uh, the entirety of the exterior of the mill and some of the spaces within it. Um, you can see Tom there uh, using that scanner uh, again in that way. Of course, some of those initial um, drivers for us have been because of conservation. I trained originally in conservation and it's um, a passion of mine still. And obviously for heritage, that's everything from safeguarding objects right the way up to, through buildings. And of course, uh, we're acutely aware of, of some of the, the um, the way in which heritage assets um, that are related to industry, perhaps in the past, have rather been um, neglected. And sadly, uh, of course, you see a headline there within the TNA referring to some of the challenges um, uh, that buildings within the city have faced. And of course, we've, we've got our own boathouse um, that uh, suffered uh, fire damage, extensive fire damage. And there are other properties in the village that have uh, had that risk. So one of the value that come, one of the bits of value that come from the sort of work we do is of course, this provides a permanent record that can be used if for instance, some of these risks are seen. And we know that the United Reformed Church has had some of those challenges. Um, it's almost 20 years ago now since it suffered from vandalism, a car crashed into um, uh, the, the mausoleum. Um, so back in 2018, uh, along with some of our students, um, so uh, undergrads, postgraduate researchers, uh, and master's students, we undertook a, a full 3D uh, survey of the United Reformed Church using the static laser scanning devices. And of course, that was very helpful to us, very fortuitous because last year with Storm Chiara back in February, we all know that part of the ceiling collapsed within the church and we were able to, to help the conservation architects with some dimensional information relating to that ceiling collapse and also to look at the stability of that ceiling because we, we could compare new data. This was me in lockdown one, and it was one of my little escapes I managed uh, to, to make into the United Reformed Church uh, to do um, that, that capture. And you can see some of the stability of the ceiling represented in these, these images here. Of course, it's not just fire uh, and um, uh, and water damage, but it's broader aspects of flooding that we also know have been seen uh, within the village. And you can see um, Joe and Tom here. Um, we went, we, we were invited into um, 
uh, to do some scanning within um, Roberts Park and the Half Moon Cafe um, in the wake of, of those floods, the Boxing Day floods. And of course, that image that you saw in the previous screen um, shows just the height, of course, that water came up to in relation to the sculpture in front of um, the Half Moon Cafe. And here in a graphic that uh, Joe's helped animate, we've got um, a, a sense of that water level um, that uh, was reached within the, within the Half Moon Cafe. Of course, for, for us, it is a bigger picture when we talk about climate. We have all been seeing um, this discussed in great detail as uh, COP26 has been underway. And we're partners with um, colleagues in, in uh, Tanzania um, uh, who uh, have been combining um, some of the music heritage and some of the threats that they see to heritage in some of the com coastal communities in Tanzania with um, awareness campaigns. And I'm not gonna play you this now, but um, if you get a chance, do have a look at this because it's a fantastic uh, video. It's, a, it's an upbeat video. It speaks to some of the work that we're doing around the globe, trying to, to, to support things. And that picture of climate, of course, resonates as we've seen with community. We've seen that flooding in Roberts Park. And here is one of the other historic parks in the city that we've also been doing work with on another European funded project, the Life Critical Project. This is Horton Park. And we've been working there with the community, looking at um, the challenge that comes from flooding uh, in a different sense, very different terrain. This is part of the Bradford Beck that feeds the heritage water features in the park, in Horton Park. And you can see that some of our expertise, again, with geophysical prospection work that Tom and, and Chris have been doing, helps us place some of those historic assets and understand the, um, the water that feeds through these cascades that were there in the design phase of the park that um, need to be um, uh, questioned when we see challenges to that water um, uh, in the current um, state of, of, for, for the heritage assets in the park. I show this image because of course we, we know that uh, Saltaire has had historic bridges as well. This is the bridge over those um, ponds within um, Horton Park. It's been one of the ways in which we've um, worked with the community, developing uh, heritage trails, looking at some of the natural heritage alongside that and celebrating that work uh, through different events. And a way for us to pick up on things that of course are very much reflective of, of that lived experience some of the uh, intergenerational memories of, of parks, as well as that historic context that comes as we see here from some of the historic imagery. And the meaning of places um, very much captured by being in those physical places, but also from some of the work that we, we're trying to, to do with communities. So coming back to what we have been doing in salt air again. We've been working with Sheena um, where we can support residents, where we can help uh, to capture the dimensional information of, of uh, features like the chimney pots here uh, for some of the buildings on, on Victoria Road, capturing a snapshot in time of buildings like the spa um, uh, on Titus Street. Um, and seeing how we, with our background in heritage and conservation, can also uh, uh, play our part and contribute to um, that knowledge and that understanding and that support. And I show this because, of course, uh, and I think, uh, yeah, Kathy's in the audience here. Um, uh, we've got, uh, of course, many of these interests coming uh, 
in from different directions for uh, the, the heritage that we have in Saltaire. You, you, mo most of you will know, of course, about it uh, um, uh, as, as a film location. And of course, Netflix, the significant work that was done for the English game. Um, and not only was that uh, uh, an opportunity for us to dive into a property in Saltaire, um, whilst um, it was vacant, um, this uh, a property on Albert Terrace that um, uh, is, uh, of course, one of many different styles of building within the village. Um, this was used for some of that filming as a film location. Uh, but the fact that we can get into these environments, scan them, use that immersive capture uh, means that they are there as an asset for filming, but also as an asset for visitors who can't normally come and see uh, the interior and understand the range of different properties that we have in the, in the village. And we've been able to leap in with Sheena's uh, help at various points um, to places like uh, the building adjacent to the spa that used to be the bakery um, and find some of these assets that are revealed through renovation works. This is um, a range that was uh, in situ still in, in the property there. We were able to get in, record it in three dimensions, but also do a little bit of of background uh, historic work. And the name here, Robert Hurd, actually is a local man. This was an individual who set up a foundry, who ran a foundry, the Prince of Wales foundry, which became the Canal Ironworks, as the name, the latter name suggests, was actually just a stone's throw away on the canal side on the way into Shipley. So this is a feature of a, a, an original feature um, of uh, this built period um, within uh, Saltaire's uh, history. And we were able to tie that to when Robert Hurd owned that ironworks and link it to that first, uh, to that phase of, of building works for, for Titus Street. So this, um, so they were sourcing um, some of these local features um, uh, for uh, the, the, the newly built properties. One of the, the things that we, um, uh, yeah, it is showing this. One of the things that we can also do with 3D data, and this is uh, an animation that just shows uh, the collapsed church in uh, the center of Amatrice, a village in, in northern Italy that suffered earthquake damage again back in 2015. Um, and, but it shows you the principle of how we can look through a photograph, how we can actually place that in 3D data um, and create that, which of course brings with it the potential for us to link through a historic lens. And these are these are lantern slides that um, uh, have um, come to light that again show the, the village at different time periods. And of course help us with some of that understanding um, that we know uh, has happened in the life of the village as um, light was let into the back alleys um, off Caroline Street, as um, we see uh, the partial demolition of some of the, um, some of these larger buildings. And you can see in this light here that uh, that stitching that was done to tidy up that um, very neatly uh, in terms of the masonry work that was done. But in the original glass lantern slide, we can see that we've obviously got another wing um, to the property there. We can also place um, uh, some of the map data that we've been working with um, through our partnership with the council and the combined um, services, uh, West Yorkshire Combined Services, that help us look 
at um, placing maps into um, that 3D space as well, um, based on terrain modeling. Uh, uh, so this is the original Lockwood and Mawson um, plan uh, for the design and the development of the village and uh, Roberts Park. Um, we can also uh, consider lost buildings. Of course, these images that come uh, from partnerships with Brad Bradford Museums and Galleries, the photo archive, again, partnering with us on Virtual Bradford. And you can see that some of the work we do with 3D reconstruction gives us that potential with buildings like the Sunday School that are still shown in these two images. We've also got a, a real appreciation that we can do more about placing salt air within the wider environment and how that environment has changed through time as well. Um, you can see, again, these historic uh, imagery from uh, Bradford Museums and Galleries um, showing Milner Fields, or, albeit in a slightly dilapidated state, but also the, the farmstead at Hurst Lock. Um, and uh, we can use some of the approaches that we've been taking um, to record structures like um, Stevenson's, uh, Robert Stevenson's Roundhouse work at Curzon Street, the, the northern end, the terminus to the, the HS2 um, link between London and Birmingham, um, whereby we've um, faithfully um, related the scan data that we captured to Robert Stevenson's original drawings, and we've been able to take historic knowledge in the reconstruction of the roof line of this, the world's first railway roundhouse. So it's a, an a, immense set of capabilities that we have and that we've built within the school and with visualizing heritage. And um, again, another sort of interesting sort of potential that, that uh, we've been looking at is of course, how we can can relate some of these changing landscapes to, to key events as well. And um, what you can see here is the exhibition building on Exhibition Road, the back end of Victoria Hall, and of course the modern features of um, Road Street, Baker Street, etc. Um, but we can also see how um, the, uh, the quarry that um, gave Saltaire some of its stone um, uh, prior to it being landscaped. Um, and this is an image uh, dating back to the 1940s. But if we go back in time further to um, 1886, 1887, we also can see and have that potential to recreate and reconstruct the um, Palace of Delight as it was described in that same locality where Road Street, Baker Street, etc., are today. So you've got the Midland Railway coming in through here. This is the exhibition building on Exhibition Road. And these um, uh, structures and features um, in the Palace of Delight, inclusive of this, uh, uh, this feature of a, a massive tent um, sat behind Wycliffe uh, School, um, uh, it, where more or less we've got um, the bottom end of, of Baker Street today. Um, uh, interesting features that we can look at through time because of the value of, of digital data. And even if it's an ephemeral feature, as we've seen with uh, these amazing uh, uh, features these arches that were created to sit alongside that festival, um, we've got the, the opportunity to, to recreate them uh, and to place them as part of this, this wider picture. There are also um, uh, features away from the, the village itself, but that have a real connection. Of course, we know Titus Salt was a mayor of the city and we know that uh, even through his during his lifetime, a major monument monument was um, inaugurated, dedicated uh, to him 
and sat right outside City Hall for a time until uh, the um, early part of the, um, uh, the, the 20th century when it moved then to its present location uh, in Lister Park. In fact, I believe it moved twice within Lister Park itself. But you can see um, uh, ways in which we can connect some of these disparate things, again, working in that virtual environment. And there are artistic and aesthetic qualities to the work we do. Um, worth mentioning Undercliff Cemetery, because of course Lockwood and Mawson have major monuments that are within Undercliff Cemetery, um, major historic cemetery if you've not visited in Bradford. Um, and here the Illingworth um, Monument uh, um, as, as one example that you'll see in some later slides relating again to that aesthetic property, the, the, the artistic qualities of some of the data that we produce. Worth mentioning some work that we are doing in conjunction with um, the council and that the council and the geospatial team that we work with are doing in partnership with Bradford Museums and Galleries um, and the, the photo archive because they are uh, helping to place that imagery um, and link it directly through to the collections um, that uh, the um, museums and galleries hold at the Industrial Museum. And this all helps us with this concept of discoverability and access, because of course, some of the, the places that we have within the village, of course, we've mentioned private dwellings, um, but also here, the United Reformed Church, um, places within some of these buildings that the public cannot reach. And you see Tom and Joe uh, in the, um, uh, the, the bell tower uh, of the United Reformed Church that you can see uh, in a little bit more detail as we move through some of these images. Um, and you can also see um, not only the, the, bell, um, the, the, the bell tower itself and where the bells were located that we were able to get into, um, but also the bell ringers um, floor and also the dining hall that um, uh, Titus uh, sought, had the private chambers he had uh, constructed that are adjacent to the balcony. Um, as you come into the, uh, uh, that are immediately above you as you come in uh, to, to the uh, main uh, door of, of the church. But we've also got spaces elsewhere. The, um, the tunnels uh, that are only open uh, sometimes within the year beneath um, Victoria Road that lead, that were effectively the, the efficient way that workers could uh, get from the mill directly into the dining hall opposite. Um, uh, and it's, it's things of, of this nature that we, we've been trying to do in Saltaire, we will be doing more of within Saltaire, but also other parts of the city. So buildings that are familiar to us, like City Hall, there are spaces within that that um, folk normally can't have uh, general access to. There are spaces, as we see within Bradford Live, that's being recon uh, reconfigured at the moment that the public can't gain access to. And um, uh, the Richard Dunn building, to think of a, a, a building of more recent uh, history that, again, you can see uh, even the detail of the slides uh, in that building that we've uh, gained access to. And you don't often see a building spread bare in, in quite this, this way. This is the innards of um, City Hall. Um, so you've got um, the, the main um, atrium, you've got the law courts, you've got the, the council chambers, number three, and you've got the banqueting hall as well. And when you go into a space like that, um, uh, virtually, we've got the potential to uh, increase that discoverability, label up features. Um, so the overmantle that we see in the banqueting hall, um, we're able to actually provide some 
understanding, some interpretation uh, to some of those, those features. But it's very much, I hope that you, what I've been sharing with you this evening, it's very much looking at heritage in uh, afresh, looking at heritage in different ways, looking at the different narratives that can come from heritage, looking at the artistic qualities. And here we see again, the Illingworth monument in Undercliff Cemetery and the work of the Bradford Heritage Recording, Recording Unit back in the 1980s to capture some of the changing voices of Bradford's industrial heritage that we can marry up and bring into enrich uh, that heritage experience. And we've been very much involved in doing so to um, change and update uh, and en enrich um, the heritage trail for the city. Um, so Visit Bradford have been working with us. Uh, we've been working with them to share uh, some of the 3D content. Um, and we've got a bid in at the moment that uh, Saltair History Club have very kindly partnered with us on. Uh, the Saltair World Heritage Education Association have very kindly partnered with us on that if we are successful, we'll be able to do some of the, the groundwork that will enable similar things. Um, uh, and we should hear uh, whether we're successful on that early on next year. So it's been a bit of a whistle stop tour. I hope it's been of interest. I hope it's been somewhat uh, enjoyable for you. Um, there are lots of people behind the work that I've been talking about today. I can't single everyone out uh, by name, but I will just point to one or two key players. So our team um, at the university, um, our head of school, Kathy Batt, who's with us tonight, Tom Sparrow, um, our senior scientist, Joe Moore, working uh, as uh, one of our PhD researchers on the virtual uh, Bradford project, and uh, Chris Gaffney, um, who's been instrumental with, with these works as well on, on various projects. And then the Virtual Bradford Project, we're working very closely with partners, Adrian Walker, Sid Simpson, uh, Joe Richings, amongst others, uh, Sheena, uh, Sheena Campbell, um, Sarah Alley, Richard Middleton, uh, but also uh, John Ashton at Bradford Museums and Galleries and Fiona Marshall at uh, the West Yorkshire Archives Service. So uh, many, many thanks to lots of people, lots of organisations, and uh, I hope that's been uh, of interest to you uh, tonight. Thank you very much for listening. Les, uh, you're on mute. Right, on mute. Right, can you hear me, Mother? Yes, okay. Hello, everybody. Um, we've uh, got plenty of time now for anybody to make comments. We've got plenty of time for people to ask questions. So uh, either put your questions in the chat box or you can give us a wave. We'll probably be able to see you. I've not uh, got pictures of everybody. It'd be nice to see pictures of everybody if I'd like to join like that. That'd be great. Hello, Sonia. She's just come up on the screen. <laughs> um, anybody else who'd like to show us their uh, mugshot? Wonderful. Yes, a few more now. Right. Hello, Colin. There's a name that I've come across. Hello, Kathy. Hello, Linda. Oh, there's Linda. Hello, Linda. <laughs> anybody else? Pauline, show me your face, I can't see you. And Maggie as well. <laughs> okay, anybody like to start us off then with a question or a comment? Have we got a wave, somebody? Does it have to be me? Yeah, Sheila, Sheila. Oh, this is Sheila Binns who's gonna be speaking to us on December the 2nd. Hello, Sheila. Hello, good evening, everybody. Um, 
you implied that this is a unique project or did I mishear you? Is the same sort of thing going on anywhere else? That's a very good question. So the, um, uh, the, the unique project that I was referring to was the, the Virtual Bradford project because um, the, 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 the work that is often done to create a digital twin is usually done by a commercial partner, a, a commercial organization. And we're very much uh, working to a brief that is to create an open data um, model. Um, so one that is freely available, one that can be used in a variety of different ways, whether it's um, regeneration, whether it's um, helping businesses. Um, uh, but um, of course, the template for virtual Bradford is one that we want to uh, to to extend. Uh, the city centre is only one part of of the Bradford district, and we would very much like to extend it and push that boundary from uh, along the, uh, the the line of the the former Bradford Canal to link up to to Saltair, and the bid that we've got in going in 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 January, uh, if we're successful, it will here for, for a January start would be to, um, uh, to, to mirror uh, and replicate that work uh, to, to make sure that we've got uh, the same sort of picture for Saltair. We're doing it, the project that we're working on in Tanzania with the University of Dar es Salaam is again, replicating this and it's a response to the UN uh, year for um, the creative economy for sustainable development, and it will be the first time that we've managed to, to replicate that. So that's one of the unique aspects. Um, is it unique, the, the sort of work that we're doing? Well, um, there are lots of partner organisations that we work with that are doing similar things. So we've got a very strong partnership with Historic Environment Scotland. I shared uh, um, and made mention of of work that we've been doing up in Shetland. These are properties that they have in care, Musa Broch, Jarlshof, uh, and then properties that Shetland Amenity Trust have um, uh, curated as well at Old Skatness, a site that the University of Bradford uh, excavated um, over quite an extended time period. Um, but it's, these are, these are, this is still an emerging area. I mean, the, the novelty is, uh, and the expertise that we've got is built up over um, 10, 11 years now, uh, over a number of key research projects. Each of those research projects has given us something sl slightly different uh, to, to work with and to build upon, whether it's the work that we're doing at the moment with um, the, the Irish Research Council and the Arts and Humanities Research Council in Ireland, um, working with the, the Irish Disability Association to look at greater access um, to heritage sites, or as I say, with, with uh, projects like we have in Tanzania, where we're pushing the boundaries to understand not just the, the, the heritage that is the built heritage on land, but also the marine heritage, because uh, it's a coastal city that we're going to going to be um, documenting there. Um, and one of the key reasons that we have a, 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 a particular innovation there around soundscapes is because there is the threat that that city, uh, the city of Bagamoyo, is threatened by the development of a major container port um, in the very near future. So every project brings something new. And whether it's a far-flung project across uh, the, the globe, uh, we're seeking to bring that benefit back into the city and the district to make the most uh, for uh, people um, uh, that, that live and share uh, the, uh, the, the passion we have for, for the heritage that's local to us. Thank you very much. Any more for any more? I'm gonna I'm gonna pose my question in this case. 
Um, Andrew, one of the things that I notice about uh, Saltaire and the images that um, I collect, and I collect a hell of a lot of them, is that there's virtually nothing, and you mentioned it really, there's virtually no nothing about housing. And it's, it's almost like there's a class system for these, these things, isn't it? There's the sort of upper class, which is Victoria Hall and the mill and the church, and there's the working class, and that's the houses. And they just don't get a mention. And the interior of the houses is the, is the key thing. Obviously, anybody can see the outside. It's the interior that's really important. And of course, in terms of heritage, it's really, really important. Because if there's one thing that's uh, very, very special about Saltaire, it's not so much the United Reformed Church in the middle of what have you, it's the fact that there's decent housing for the working class. Absolutely. And we, and we, and we just, we don't know how, we don't know much about that at all. So if, if at some stage we can get together on a project which actually does pick up on all those uh, features that are still around, it would be wonderful. That, that's right. very much our, our hope that, that the sort of work that we do can be done in, in partnership with, with organisations like the Saltaire History Club, like the Saltaire World Heritage Education Association, and obviously the businesses and um, those other stakeholders that we have uh, in, in the village and, and surrounding, uh, and seek to, to, to absolutely do this, um, create the, the sort of baseline data that we can add those narratives, those stories to. And you mentioned the the, the housing; it, it's 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 central to to what we uh, are keen to keen to do in in the village. It's one of the key reasons that, of course, it was inscribed on the World Heritage list. And we know that. Um, uh, well, I know, having lived in one of them, just how um, when you go into uh, other houses in the village, every, the configuration is different. Uh, mm -hmm. Even when you strip it bare to, to, the, to the bare bones, you've got the different phases during which the, the village was constructed. Yeah. And you've got these little hidden assets that come to light as um, uh, we were able to, to, to document in the um, bakery next to the former spa uh, shop. Uh, and it's, it, it's collectively working you know, it's going to take time. It's going to, it's not going to be an immediate thing, but where a vacant property comes to, uh, to notice, if there's a chance for us to jump in and scan the interior and get that sense of the shape and the different uh, details uh, on the inside as well as on the outside, that will help that journey of understanding and communication that we can have uh, to visitors and residents alike. Um, you know, it, it, it was inscribed for its universal value, but of course it's, it, it's a value to each of us because we have a real uh, close affinity with the village, those of us who know it, who've lived within it. And um, that, that dimensional information can be very helpful for uh, a young couple who may be needing to renovate and reconstruct the building as, yes, as well. Yeah, yeah a good point. Mm, thank you. There are, right. unless anybody's got, a, a, if somebody's got their hand up, there are some questions yeah. in, the, in the chat as well, but if... Uh, yeah, just a quick questions. one, Andy. I just wondered how bulky the equipment is. I mean, can you go down places like uh, Bradford Beck and uh, follow in that sort of confined space? So the limitation with with a confined space is more on the on the personnel who may need to to carry kit. We've um, we've uh, so one of the the projects uh, that Joe's been doing has been to to get inside some of the built uh, structures um, heritage structures in, in Bradford, um, and even within a mill building like. Um, Allerton Mill that we were able to get into six months after it had been vacated, it's already deteriorating 
in that short space of time. And you've got everything from pigeons flying around to water um, to structural instability in, in certain parts of buildings. So there, there are lots of health and safety challenges for some of these locations. Um, increasingly, because of the capabilities we've got with the use of drones and with the use of um, uh, systems that we can put on, on mobile devices that we can automate um, that don't require a person uh, to, uh, to, to hold it, we can get into some of those more challenging spaces. And absolutely, the Bradford Beck is, is a great example. We've got clear aspirations to, to map not just what is above ground within the city, but some of those, those interesting spaces within it uh, and beneath it as well. Um, but the biggest challenge uh, initially is, is, is health and safety. Um, uh, so uh, whilst we have gone through rigorous training, um, uh, to to uh, to uh, be on construction sites for the sort of work that we do, there is additional training that's required normally for uh, for confined spaces as well. Um, and I've done that when we excavated a crypt in in Sunderland um, uh, 10, 11 years ago now, but um, I'm out of um, uh, current. Um, registration on that, but it is the sort of thing that can be done for sure. Yeah. Can I just pick up on uh, John's uh, question, which is in the chat? Uh, it's John Anderson. What do the colours red, green, and blue in the three images mean? So, yeah, really good question about the coloration of some of the the mobile mapping data and 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 also some of the laser scan data. What what those colors uh, code to and can represent are usually one of two things. Um, uh, commonly, it's um, giving elevation. So it's height information above um, ground surface. Um, but uh, for some of the imagery, it also represents what we term uh, the laser intensity. In other words, how that laser has responded, interacted with the surface, and how that laser return um, uh, speaks to the, the fabric of, of, of the stonework, for instance. And we would get a, a different laser intensity if that stonework is, is well preserved um, versus stonework that is, is very porous, is perhaps suffering from damp, um, and that would that would show very differently. So again, from that conservation perspective, there's information that the sort of data we we generate can uh, can provide. And increasingly, I, I, I left the slide out as you saw. I had a lot of slides, um, but increasingly we we're also working with something uh, called uh, multispectral imagery. In other words, we can go beyond the visible spectrum to look into the infrared or the ultraviolet and use that uh, imagery as well. And a classic example of that is something called thermography. Uh, as the name would suggest, it's, it's looking at temperature and temperature variation. And we've got those capabilities that we have on, on drones uh, these days. And we can, we've been using it in um, Horton Park to look at the moisture flow through the soil, but it equally could look at color variation relative to temperature to understand thermal efficiency of, of heritage buildings. Um, so, and, and of course, you'd get that moisture return in the same way uh, for porous degraded stonework as well. So lots of, lots of things that it can absolutely cater for um, and, and help, uh, help with. Okay, um, we've got uh, two questions in the chat, so we'll take those next, please. A uh, bit, bit of a long one here from Adam, but I'll read it out. Uh, do you create 3D models from the point clouds? I'm a structural draftsman, and I'm interested in what you do with the point clouds once you've generated them. 
i.e. create a model using Autodesk Revit or equivalent software. Really interesting talk, he says. Thank you. Thanks very much, Adam. Absolutely. The, the, the overlaps we have these days in the work we're doing um, branch into architecture, into design, into buildings information modeling, into the creative um, uh, aspects that I've mentioned as well. So the sort of software environments we work within um, allow us not only to do uh, uh, quite nifty things in terms of that data capture, but also how we use it. And you've seen some of the, the, the visualizations we can do with point cloud data, but we can also render those point clouds. We can, we can certainly do uh, a lot with um, uh, structure from motion photogrammetry as well, which gives us color texture information um, uh, for uh, the fabric of buildings and understanding that. And that was one of the, the requirements for the Virtual Bradford project, whereby we could have a very faithful uh, representation of, of the built environment that could be um, a base layer if you like, whereby architects uh, and uh, draft uh, people and um, uh, those interested in, in planning could all make use of that open uh, uh, data and do so um, if, for instance, an extension on a property, not, no, I'm not talking about extensions in salt air, because of all the constraints, but on you know changing that built uh, environment in, in other parts of the city, so it's it, it's um, it's got many uh, potential uh, uses. We can do your standard um, uh, uh, plan views and elevations, and and you probably saw some of that from the the sort of outlines we presented for the United Reform Church. Um, and of course, looking at structural stability was very much where we were trying to drive at with the, the work we did for, for the um, uh, collapse with the ceiling. So it depends on, on, on the end user, what they want, how they want that data uh, represented, but we can do your standard um, 2D uh, drawings from that 3D data, as well as create 3D models and 3D environments, those digital worlds. Wow. <laughs> I'm, 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 I was wondering how far you're moving away from being an archaeologist at this point. <laughs> That's a good question. And, and uh, the, um, the folk at Bradford Council um, uh, often uh, uh, jokingly say, why would you go to to an uh, an archaeologist, an archaeological scientist for for uh, uh, creating something as innovative as a, a digital twin? Uh, for for us, it's because of our heritage within the school, within the university. We were a department. We were the the first. Um, uh, Department of Archaeological Sciences in, in the country. We grew out of um, uh, the sort of uh, nuclear physics as it was in, in Bradford um, way before my time, but it's it stuck with us. We've been very much focused on skills development, we've been focused on technology innovations, and we've been focused about uh, on applications, um, how we can make what we do current and important in today's society. So absolutely, we still do archeology. span We still work in that uh, buried environment as well. And you saw that with the work we've done with HS2 at, at Curzon Street in Birmingham and at uh, Fountains Abbey. But it's much more about how we can relate that to um, the environment that we all inhabit. Um, uh, and bring with that, that sense of discoverability, that interpretation, that use that is so much broader um, 
So heritage is one vehicle that allows us to do that. Uh, it's, um, it's meant that we are a much broader uh, uh, department in our outlook these days. And I would almost see archaeology these days as a subset of, of heritage. It's one of the many tools that we that we use and that we bring into uh, that relevance to uh, everyday uh, uses and, and modern society. Right. Um, I'm going back to the uh, chat now and Pauline has uh, asked um, she said that I was interested in the Shipley Forge. Uh, where was this? Does it still exist? Uh, uh, that's a, a, another great question. And if uh, at the moment you look to um, the stretch of, uh, of canal side um, that is, um, uh, I'm just trying to place it. The, the, there is current building work that is going on at the moment yeah. um, that is opposite um, uh, Shipley Wharf. And um, it's, it, it's adjacent to that. So there's the, the hotel next door, is it an Ibis? It's, it, it's in that sort of vicinity. Yeah. Um, I should have pulled a map together to, to show uh, folk this evening. But it's um, it, 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 it's not far from Victoria Mills, um, which of course is um, uh, it, it, it is sort of on the on the river side, but this is um, just uh, uh, yeah opposite Shipley Wharf more or less. Yeah. Yeah. Is it accessible? Um, there's there's nothing to be seen, and I suspect there's there may well be nothing that is, mm. is left um, e even below ground um, because they're relatively modern buildings, and uh, of course, um, even if there was a corner of it in the in the recent work that's been taking place uh, prior to to construction, um, I, I suspect that there the, the was very little. A little surviving mm. but it's it, it, it's fascinating that an asset that is in one of the houses that normally we can't access the public can't see that 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 comes from such a local source um uh to to Saltaire. um in the same way as the as the building materials um came from that quarry um, that is so so close by as well. So it was definitely um, um, together with Lockwood and Mawson, looking at very efficient ways of of, um, of building uh, the village. And of course, we know it it was built relatively uh, relatively rapidly. Yeah. Can I can I just confirm what you said about the existence of this place? It's, it's all gone, you know, the original or the Victorian bit of it is all gone. Yes. But that, that forge, I did a little bit of work on it uh, a few months ago. I can't remember much anyway, but I certainly can't remember much a few months back. Um, and there's quite a lot on the internet about it, about a forge. There seems to be a group of people who were sort of uh, forge nerds who love these places. And you can find out quite a lot about it. And the, as I recall it, I think I saw things like um, posters or adverts for the forge uh, uh, when I was looking that up. And it is, as you say, it's, it's on this sort of northern side of the, of the canal by the wharf, by the Ibis, or by the, you know, that sort of area. Yeah. Um, Anybody else, please? Any questions, any comments? Give us a wave if you want to say something. Oh, oh, here we are. We've got a nice comment from Sheila. Your work is absolutely fascinating and utterly jaw-dropping for those like me learning about it for the first time. An excellent talk. Thank you. That's great. It's, it's a bit different, Sheila, isn't it? From uh, Sheila was speaking to the Victorian Society. 
about the uh, about some of the uh, artistic features, the aesthetic features of model villages, including Saltaire. So she's moved from that, which was about a week ago, into the 21st century, haven't you, Sheila? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for that comment, Sheila. And, and Les, that's a wonderful segue into the next talk, isn't it? In December. Absolutely. But it's also, we've also got a segue into the, the, the uh, thing after that, uh, Andrew, because the me after that is about maps. And it's on maps where you'll see where that forge was. You can see the forge on the map. So we're going to be looking at that in March. We're going to be looking at maps. They can tell us about so that's a segue but then and then March. Final comments. First of all, vote thanks. A vote of thanks for uh, being our, our techie chair. But most most importantly a big big vote of thanks to Andy for the uh, for the presentation. I gather from people who have been saying that you really found it fantastic. Yes, let's give him a round of applause.